Well, good evening. Good evening. Hope everyone is doing well tonight. It is a joy to be with you. It truly, truly is. I'm very grateful for this opportunity to come and preach and teach uh, over the next couple of days. I'm very grateful for uh, Eric and his uh, reaching out to me to invite me to come to speak at this conference. And, and uh, what better topic than the sufficiency of Scripture? Uh, I, I tell people all the time as I travel and preach and teach around the world that, that um, if you're going to be anyone today in uh, the theologically conservative evangelical circles, you're going to at least have to give lip service to the fact that you believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. The battles over inerrancy were fought in the late 70s, early mid 80s, really hashed those battles out uh, in the SBC anyway. And um, by God's grace, those battles were won, at least theoretically. So if you're going to be anybody in theologically conservative evangelical circles, you're going to have to say that you believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. Now, whether or not you believe it personally is a different matter, but you're going to at least have to say you do. But where the battle is really being fought today is not so much over inerrancy, although those fires still smolder. The real battle today is over sufficiency. Is God's word sufficient? And we are losing that battle today big time, big time losing that battle. And so I'm very grateful for this conference. I'm grateful for uh, this church and all those who have worked to put it together. And I look forward to our to our time together over the next couple of days. So let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and then we'll begin. Father, how grateful we are that uh, you have given this day to us an opportunity to gather around your word, to gather as believers. We thank you for the fellowship that we have with one another. We thank you for the fellowship that we have with you through the merits of your son Christ, his person, his work on the cross. We thank you that we have been adopted into your family uh, by the Holy Spirit of God and, and uh, sealed indeed. Uh, we, we thank you for that. We thank you for that uh, just unspeakable, magnanimous privilege that you have given to us by condescending to us in your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for your word that you have preserved for us. It is without error. It will accomplish what you have uh, deemed it and decreed it to accomplish. And indeed, it is sufficient for us in everything that we need to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Father, I pray uh, that as I and James preach and teach over the next couple of days, we pray that uh, you would be glorified and honored in what we say. We pray that your Holy Spirit would guide us into truth, that he would sanctify us in the truth of your word. And all these things we ask and pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, my uh, first topic tonight, as we kick things off here, is this question about how does God speak to us today? Hearing from heaven. Uh, there are a lot of people out there that say that God speaks to them. Uh, God spoke to me and he told me to tell you that you need to do such and such. Uh, uh, Pastor, God spoke to me and he told me to tell you that our church needs to go in this direction. And there's lots and lots of people that claim that God speaks to them. And the bookshelves in Christian bookstores practically sag under the weight of books uh, written on how to hear the voice of God. You know, five easy steps, three easy steps. You know, follow these steps to, to learn how to hear God's voice. And maybe you have heard people say this. Well, God spoke to me. He told me this. He told me that. God spoke to me. There's a lot of people out there that God seems to speak to more than he ever did to Moses. <laughs> and maybe when you've heard people say this, well, God spoke to me, and he, he said this, he said that. Has it ever made you wonder, what's wrong with me? You know, I, I, I don't hear God speak to me like that. Is there something wrong with me? You know, is there something wrong with my walk with the Lord? Are these people more spiritual than I am? Do they have a closer walk with God than I do? Am, am I even saved? And so if you've ever wondered that, if you've ever had those thoughts and struggled with those things, I hope that this uh, next, whatever, 45, 50 minutes or so will, 
will encourage you. But let's dive into this, hearing from heaven. So where did this whole notion of God speaking to us outside of the Bible begin? Well, it kind of began with something known as pietism. Pietism was a movement in the late 1600s, early 1700s. It was kind of a reaction to what had been at least perceived as a overly intellectualized theology. Uh, coming out of the Protestant Reformation, some people believe that the, their, the doctrine and theology had been, become just a little bit too intellectualized, uh, a little too sterile. And so there was this movement that, that grew up known as pietism. It began with a man named Philip Spinner. And uh, Philip Spinner was no heretic, not by any stretch of the imagination. But he did begin to put a bit more emphasis on uh, feelings and emotions than what had traditionally uh, been placed. And after Philip Spinner, you had a guy named Augustus Franck and then Count Nicholas von Zinzendorf after these guys. And as Paul says to Timothy that uh, error begets more error, right? He says that false teaching spreads like gangrene. Error always begets more error. As pietism grew, it became more and more heretical. And by the time you get to Count Nicholas von Zinzendorf, uh, you're really getting into some areas of heresy. And uh, so that's kind of where this whole notion of God speaking outside of Scripture uh, began. But I want us to look at a couple of terms to kind of fr provide a framework here. Define a couple of terms. This will help us. Revelation. Revelation refers to God revealing new information that up to the point of revelation had previously been hidden. Okay, God revealing new information. Now, that's what revelation is. You may have heard this term, illumination. Illumination refers to the enabling work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of believers to understand and appropriate the truths of Scripture. And it's very important that we keep these two terms separate and understand them. You may have heard someone say, oh, well, I got revelation on this. God gave me revelation on that. Uh, no, he didn't. No, you didn't get any revelation. God's not giving any more revelation. Okay. Now, what may have happened is illumination. And that is when, as a believer, the Holy Spirit of God who indwells you helps you to understand God's word and gives you the ability to obey it. So illumination should be a regular part of the life of the believer. Not revelation. Okay, so let's keep those two terms uh, clear in our minds. Revelation, no. Illumination, yes. But divine revelation knowledge. You may have heard some people say, well, you know, uh, God gives a divine revelation knowledge. Well, where did this come from? Well, um, it, of course, it came from pietism, but the more modern version of this comes from a man named Essek W. Kenyon. This term divine revelation knowledge was first coined by Essek W. Kenyon. Uh, Kenyon, you could call him the, uh, the grandfather of the modern word of faith movement, the health and wealth, name and acclaim it, prosperity gospel. Uh, Kenyon is very heavily quoted by people today such as Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagin, of course Kenneth Hagin's dead now, but Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hinn, Joyce Meyer, uh, all these prosperity preachers appeal to Essek Kenyon as one of their spiritual forebears. But Kenyon believed in two different types of knowledge. The first of these is sensory knowledge. That's which we get through our five senses, sight, sound, taste, smell, touch. Uh, all of us agree to that, you know, no big deal there. But he believed in another kind of uh, knowledge. This is revelation knowledge, and this is supernatural knowledge that Kenyon believed came only from God. But according to Kenyon, here's the catch. These two spheres of knowledge are mutually exclusive. And what that means is, is that reasoning or logical thought is of no value. So in other words, if you want to go deep with God, if you want to get to the deep, secret, hidden things of God, you've got to disengage rational thought. Put your brain in neutral. Now, Kenyon's teaching on this is really a modern version of the ancient heresy known as Gnosticism. Gnosticism is derived from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. And Gnosticism, it's, it's kind of a broad uh, topic and issue, but 
but for our purposes here, basically boiled down to its basic elements, is a system of thought in which a, a demiurge, that's a, a lesser God, created and he rules the world, uh, and salvation was obtained through secretly divined revelation knowledge. But to get this knowledge, you had to put your brain in neutral, put the old noodle in park. And it was through this disengaged intellect that you could get this secret divine revelation knowledge through which you could obtain salvation. So I, I want to give you a few examples of this, more modern examples. This from Benny Hinn. This may be one of Benny Hinn's most infamous uh, divine revelation knowledge nuggets, if you will. Benny Hinn said this, I want you all to look at me and I want you all to listen carefully to what I'm going to say. This was put to the test by three theologians who read my book because it's in my book. It's not a very easy thing to understand, but let's pray that the Holy Ghost will help all of us. Man, I feel revelation knowledge already coming on me. I want you to lift your hands. Something new is going to happen here today. Holy Spirit, take over in the name of Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, are you here to learn? God the Father, ladies and gentlemen, is a person, and he is a triune being by himself separate from the Son and the Holy Ghost. What did you say? Hear it, hear it. God the Father is a person, God the Son is a person, God the Holy Ghost is a person, but each one of them is a triune being by himself. If I can shock you, and maybe I should, there's nine of them. You say, well, I never heard that. Well, you think you're in this church to hear things you've heard for the last 50 years? So under divine revelation knowledge, Benny Hinn has taught a nine-member Godhead, that there are actually nine members of the Godhead. Now, Benny Hinn was challenged on this, rightly so, and he said, oh, well, I just said that in jest. It was a joke, and everybody laughed. Well, it wasn't a joke. I've got the audio recording of him, of him when he actually said it. He was not joking. He claimed he got this from God. Of course, that is very heretical. Nine-member Godhead is heretical. This from Jesse Duplantis. Jesse Duplantis, writing in his magazine, Voice of the Covenant, on page 7, writes this article, and he says, The Lord showed me a new way to look at Matthew 17, verse 20. Now, I have this word new highlighted for a reason. Dear friends, if you're reading a passage of Scripture and all of a sudden you think you have found a sick, secret hidden meaning to that particular verse of Scripture that no other Christian in the 2,000-year history of the Christian church has ever seen before except you, you're wrong. Okay? I don't mean it ugly, but you're wrong. If you think you have discovered a hidden meaning that has escaped the attention of every other Holy Spirit and dwelt believer for two millennia, you need to th take another look at it. But that's what Jesse Duplantis claimed happened to him. Matthew 17, verse 20, of course, this is when Jesus was talking about having faith the size of a mustard seed. Jesse Duplantis goes on to say, he says, he showed me, referring to God, God showed me that most people preach on the properties of the seed, but the Lord gave me a deeper understanding on this verse. This, this is Gnosticism. The Lord gave me a deeper understanding on this verse when he told me, I put a dimension on the size of the mustard seed, but I did not put a dimension on the size of the mountain. I didn't understand, said Jesse. Look, God explained, I made sure you understood the dimension of the faith was small, like a mustard seed, but I never set a limit on the size of the mountain. Why do you think I didn't set a limit on the size of the mountain, but limited faith to the size of a grain of mustard seed? I still didn't have the answer, said Jesse. Here comes God's answer. Because if you use any more, you'd blow me off my throne. Dear friends, I would submit to you that the only one who is going to be blown off of his throne is Jesse Duplantis by God. But again, he claims that God told him this. This is heresy. Now, those are a bit extreme examples, but here's one that's not so extreme. Oh, Experiencing God by Henry Blackaby. Experiencing God by Henry Blackaby. Probably 99% of the Southern Baptist churches in existence today have done experiencing God. Now, I went through it myself twice. I actually taught it, I'm ashamed to say, back before I, I knew any better. Shouldn't have been teaching. But what happened to the, did we lose the, did we lose the screen? Oh, there we go. Okay. 
I would submit to you that experiencing God has, is singularly most responsible for introducing charismatic theology into at least theoretically non-charismatic churches. Experiencing God, that was introduced in the early 90s. Henry Blackaby writes this on page 87. He says, he says, if you have trouble hearing God speak, you are in trouble at the heart, at the very heart of your Christian experience. So hearing God speak to you must be a very, very important part of the Christian life. And if you are having trouble hearing God speak or discerning when he is speaking to you, you're in trouble at the heart of your Christian experience. So the stakes are high, are they not? Watch this from Robert Morris, pastor of Gateway Church in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. So, again, hearing God speak is very, very important. And if you think that God is not speaking to you outside of Scripture, you have trouble hearing God speak to you outside of Scripture, then you're in trouble. You're in trouble. You really don't have a relationship with God because that's not personal. Back to experiencing God, Henry Blackaby says, I sensed God's call. I prayed and sensed God wanted me to do such and such. I began to sense a great urgency from God. We began to sense God leading us. Our church sensed, are you seeing a pattern here? Sensed God wanted us to da-da-da. One of our members felt led to do such and such. I've always wondered, what does this sensing feel like? Apparently, Henry Blackaby knows it so well that it's very clear to him that he never does explain really what the sensing feels like. This is modern mysticism. This is a modern-day version of Gnosticism, mysticism, and it's packaged in such a way that if you are having trouble with this, then you really can't live the Christian life. Bill Hybels, former pastor of Willow Creek Church, Bill Hybels wrote this in his book, The Power of a Whisper. He says, one day a few summers ago, I decided to spend an afternoon alone with God. I hopped on a boat, headed out on the lake, and prepared to hear meaningful words from heaven. I sat there for an hour and heard nothing. I sat there for a second hour and heard precisely nothing. Partway through hour number three, I thought, I love being on the water, but what's with the silence, God? So apparently hearing God speak to him was a regular occurrence for Bill Hybels. I was going through a time at Willow, tough time at Willow Creek and de desperately needed a little encouragement from above. Just as I was ready to haul up the anchor and motor back toward the harbor, I saw a Bud Light beer can float by. I stood there staring at the can, wondering, is this a message from God? If so, what could it mean? Am I supposed to drink Bud Light? Am I supposed to tell my congregation not to drink Bud Light? Is there a message inside the can? This is a pastor, and he thinks God is sending him messages through Bud Light beer cans? How are you supposed to make sense out of this? You know, how, so every time you see something that might be just a little bit out of the ordinary, you think that that's somehow God trying to get a message to you somehow? How are you, how are you supposed to make sense out of all this? Bill Hybel says, without a hint of exaggeration, I can boldly declare that God's low-volume whispers have saved me from a life of sure boredom and self-destruction. Really? Really? What about the... Bible. God says, is not my word like a fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer which shatters a rock? Does that sound boring to you? Doesn't sound very boring to me. And I might point out the obvious, that these low volume whispers apparently did not save him from disqualifying himself from ministry. But we're being told that God speaks to us in these whispers and these still small voices. And we are also told that prayer is a two-way street. Have you heard this before? Prayer is a two-way street, right? We pray to God and then we listen for him 
to talk back to us. This from Robert Morris. You know, if we said, we're going to have a class on prayer, you said, I need that. And even the disciples said, teach us to pray. But let me remind you that hearing God is the second half of prayer. Because if you can't hear God, why would you pray? Now, one reason is to make our requests and petitions be known to God. But God never intended prayer to be a giving of our to-do list to Him every morning. He intended prayer to be communication between the Father and His children. And if you'll just take some time and start to listen, you'll be amazed. So this is standard teaching, that prayer is a two-way street. And now the first thing I might point out, he cited the verse in, from Luke chapter 11 when the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. And, and now think of how did Jesus respond to that request? Okay, here's how you pray. You pray and you talk to God for a while and then you listen for his voice. You listen for him to talk back to you. Is that what he said? No. I mean, if prayer was a two-way street and the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. I mean, the proverbial ball is sitting on the tee, right? Ready for Jesus to knock it out of the park and say, okay, this is how you pray. You talk to God for a while and then you listen for the still small voice. You listen for him to talk back to you. Jesus didn't say anything like that, did he? No, he said, when you pray, pray in this way and he Gave them the Lord's Prayer. But we've all been told this. And I used to do this, and I don't mean to mock, but a lot of people do this because this is what we're taught. So let's say you've got something going on in your life. You've got some big, big decision to make. You're not sure what the right thing to do is. You need some direction from the Lord. And so you've been taught that prayer is a two-way street. And this is what people do. I used to do it. This is what people do. And they're very sincere. I'm not mocking. They're very sincere. You turn the TV off, put the kids to bed, and you get into your, you know, you sit down at your study or your dining room table or wherever you do your Bible study or prayer, and you bow your head and you pray to the Lord and you talk to him for a while and you say, Lord, this is what's going on. This is what I, I need. I need some help. I need some direction for you. from you. Tell me what you want me to do. And you get real quiet and you listen real hard. And then, inevitably, what happens? A thought, right? Just kind of just kind of flashes through our minds, right? And we think, oh, oh, was that you, Lord? Or was that me? Was that God? Or was that the pizza I had tonight? I mean, how do you know? How do you know when it's God speaking to you? Have you ever been there? Have you ever done this? Dear friends, you will search the scriptures in vain for anything like that modeled in the Bible. It's nowhere. When God spoke to people, and it wasn't nearly as often as what a lot of people realize, people have this idea that God was just speaking to everyone willy-nilly all the time throughout the days of the Bible. That's not true. That's not true. There were, there were major characters in the Old Testament that went years and years and years, some of them their entire lives. Nehemiah, he never heard God speak to him outside of Scripture. Went their entire lives without hearing God speak to them. And so God wasn't speaking nearly as often as what we think. There was 400 years between the Old and New Testament. God didn't say anything at all, nothing. But when he did speak, it was crystal clear. People knew exactly what God said and they knew exactly who said it. The only exception to that was the boy Samuel. But even at that, he knew exactly what God said. He just didn't know who was saying it at first. But there was none of this, was that you, Lord? Was that me? Was that just some random thought in my head? You, you won't find that modeled anywhere in Scripture. Even in the New Testament, when the Holy Spirit spoke, he spoke very clearly. Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. There was none of this, is that you, Lord? There was no, no instructions. Nowhere in the New Testament will you find any instructions on how to hear the voice of God. 
And if this was such an important part of our lives as Christians, if this was such an important part of the life of the church, don't you think that somewhere in the pastoral epistles that Paul would have said something about how to hear the voice of God? I mean, there's lots in the pastoral epistles about doctrine, about theology, about how to to do church, about qualifications for elders, teaching sound doctrine, refuting those who contradict, lots of stuff about that. Nothing, not a hint of anything about how to hear the voice of God. And yet our bookshelves and Christian bookstores sag under the weight of them. It's a very common thing. Here's another example. Uh Uh-oh. Jesus Calling by Sarah Young. Ladies, bear with me. This is the hottest selling devotional book anywhere on the market. This is literally light years ahead of everything else out there. It is light years ahead. I mean, it is out as of 2015, and that was four years ago. This book had, had sold over 15 million copies, and it's been translated into umpteen different languages. This is no ordinary devotional book. I want to tell you why I'm so concerned about this book, Jesus Calling. Sarah Young read a book entitled God Calling that was written in the 1930s by two anonymous female mystics. We don't know who these ladies were. Uh, I've got a copy of God Calling myself on my shelf. But she read this book. These two ladies who wrote God Calling almost 100 years ago, they practiced waiting in the presence of God. And it's like they practiced so much and they finally tuned in to just the right frequency. And then when they hit just the right frequency, God started talking to them started calling them, and they wrote down what God was saying. This was Sarah Young's inspiration for Jesus Calling. Now, I'm going to show you excerpts from her book, copied, pasted, word for word. Sarah Young says, During the same year, in 92, I began reading God Calling, a devotional book by two anonymous listeners. These women practiced waiting quietly in God's presence, pencils and papers in hand, recording the messages they received from him. Sarah Young says, I knew that God communicated with me through the Bible, but I yearned for more. I yearned for more. You see, the Bible was just not enough for Sarah Young. And dear friends, that is exactly where so many professing believers are today. The Bible just is not enough for people. I've got to have something more. I need something more than the Bible. Here's the question I have for all all those folks who would say, I need something more. Have you completely mastered this book? From Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21, you have completely mastered this book. You have squeezed every drop of truth. There is to be squeezed. You have mastered it from cover to cover. There's nothing else you can learn from this book. If the answer to that question is no, and it is. Because all of us could spend a thousand lifetimes studying this book, accumulate our knowledge, and just barely scratch the surface of what's here. So if the answer to that question is no, then please don't tell me the Bible's not enough. You don't even understand what you've got in black and white right in front of you. Don't tell me the Bible's not enough. Sarah Young says, I decided to listen to God with pen in hand, writing down whatever I believed he was saying. Houston, we have a problem. Just like the ladies who wrote God Calling, they wrote down what he said. Sarah Young tuned in to just the right frequency, and when she hit just the right frequency, Jesus started calling her, and with pen in hand, she wrote down what he said. If that is what is happening, if Jesus is calling her, Jesus is speaking to her, and she is writing down what he said, you know what she's doing? She's writing Scripture. That's what she's doing. She's writing Scripture. And when you read these devotionals, 365 of them, they're all written in the first person for Jesus. I, Jesus, will do such and such. I am this. I am that. So if that's what's happening, she's writing Scripture. So whatever Jesus is saying to her that she writes down, we should add to this book. There's just one problem with that. This book says do not add to this book. Almost like she knew the claim that she was making, she said this, I knew these writings were not as inspired as Scripture is, but they were helping me grow closer to God. Now, wait a minute. Why weren't they? 
So she's trying to hedge here a little bit. She's trying to have her cake and eat it too. She says, I knew these writings were not as inspired as Scripture. Why aren't they? If Jesus is speaking to her and she's writing down what he says, then that should be just as authoritative as any verse in the Bible. You can't have your canonical cake and eat it too. If God is still speaking today to people in a direct quotable sense outside of Scripture, then whatever God says should be just as authoritative as any verse in Scripture. And that goes for anyone who says God spoke to me and said, quote, da-da-da-da-da. Did he? Well, whatever God said to you should be just as authoritative as John 3.16, just as authoritative as Romans 10, 9, and 10, any verse in this book. So we should add that to this book. Dear friends, God cannot speak less authoritatively on one occasion than he does on another. If God is speaking, God is speaking. And God cannot speak in the Bible and really, really, really mean it. But when he speaks to us today outside of the Bible, he still means it, but he doesn't mean it quite as much as he meant it here. How does that work? Did he have his fingers crossed? He just sort of meant it? If God is speaking, God is speaking. And whatever he says, we should add to this book. Except for this book. It says do not add to this book. Sarah Young's not the only one by any stretch. Beth Moore does this as well. A lot. A lot. Just as one example in her book, When Godly People Do Ungodly Things, Beth Moore says this. She says, I am being as honest as I know how to be when I say that I did not write these pages by simple preference. I wrote them because had I not, the rocks in my yard would have cried out. We all know that reference, right? What God does with what he has required is his business. I entrust this message entirely to the one who delivered it while I sat bug-eyed. This is just one of many examples of Beth Moore claiming that God speaks to her. And notice she was just the passive recipient of this. This is not something that she wrote from her own intellect. She was this passive recipient and she just sat bug-eyed while God downloaded information to her and she wrote it. And again, just like with Sarah Young and Jesus Calling, if that's really what's happening, then Beth Moore is writing Scripture. She's writing Scripture. This is a tweet from Beth Moore from uh, July of last year. Beth Moore says this, There's a time to give up and a time to keep trying. Sometimes the time to keep trying feels a whole lot like time to give up. The only difference is the still small voice of the Holy Spirit within you saying, Try again. It's not the same old Monday if there are brand new mercies. Now, what I want to focus on is this phrase here. She says, the still small voice of the Holy Spirit within you saying, try again. I really grow weary of hearing that phrase, the still small voice used out of context. You know where that comes from? It comes from 1 Kings chapter 19. This is Elijah. Elijah is the one who heard the still small voice. And friends, open your Bibles, read it. This was not some inner impression in Elijah's head. Elijah had just called down fire, and then he ran like a little girl from Jezebel, which is kind of weird, but he ran and fled and and found himself in, in this cave. And when he was inside the cave, he heard literally in the Hebrew, the most literal reading, rendering of it is, is, a, a quiet whisper, he, or, or the sound of a, of a whisper. So he was in the cave and he heard something, but it wasn't something inside his head. It was not internal, it was external. And then when you read the passage, it says he walked out to the front of the cave, to the entrance of the cave, to hear it again, and then that's when God spoke to him very clearly. So this was not some inner impression. This was not some voice inside his head. It was not internal, it was external. So can we please stop using the still small voice as some inner impression inside your noggin? That's not what it was. External, not internal. This from Beth Moore. What God began to say to me about five years ago, and I'm telling you it sent me on such a trek with him that my head is still whirling over it. He began to say to me, I'm going to tell you something right now, Beth. 
And boy, you write this one down and you say it as often as I give you utterance to say it. My bride is paralyzed by unbelief. My bride is paralyzed by unbelief. So God gave her that message and he told her to write it down and he said, you say it as often as I give you utterance to say it. My bride is paralyzed by unbelief. Is it really? My bride, the church. The church is paralyzed by unbelief. I didn't know that. Did you know that? I didn't know that. I guess it must be true because God told her that. So new information, despite the fact that the Bible says that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Doesn't sound very paralyzed to me, does it to you? Now, people claiming to hear God speak in the new revelation that they dispense to all of us not so spiritual folks who aren't as spiritual as they are because we just don't hear God speak to us like they apparently do. Uh, it ranges from heretical to superfluous, nonsensical. It can also be physically dangerous. I want to show you, what I'm about to show you may be, at least from a physical standpoint, the most shocking thing I have ever seen on quote-unquote Christian television. And it happened just a little over a year ago, February of last year, on Sid Roth. Sid Roth has this TV program on TVN called It's Supernatural. And Sid Roth, if you've ever watched Sid Roth, he has the looniest, craziest, most, honestly, honestly, I, I really believe if, if I called up Sid Roth's television program and said, hey, I was just abducted by aliens and Elvis was on the spaceship and Bigfoot and they took me to heaven and I saw my own personal mansion. Elvis gave me a guided tour of heaven. I really, honestly, I think they would have me on the next week. <laughs> That's not, I mean, if you've never watched it, it, it honestly, if, if one one hundredth of one percent if one one hundredth of one percent of what Sid Roth claimed on his show and his guests claimed on his show is true, then every demon and Satan himself would be bound. Every person would be wealthy. We would be shuttling back and forth between heaven and earth. We would be living in a Christian utopia. No one would be sick if one one hundredth of one percent of what they said was true. But watch this from Sid Roth. Sid Roth here. Welcome to my world, where it's naturally supernatural. I have read of the great men and women of faith. One in particular intrigues me so much. His name, Smith Wigglesworth. He had some of the most outrageous miracles I ever heard of in my life. Uh, let me give you one example. Some parents had a two-month-old baby dying in the hospital. The parents kidnapped the child, took the child to a Smith Wigglesworth meeting, and Smith looks at the child, looks at the parents and say, can I do what God tells me to do? Well, what would you do if you were the parents? The child's dying anyway, right? He takes the baby, two month old, throws the baby against the wall. The baby. Then the baby's on the floor. He have you ever seen someone play soccer? Have you ever seen them uh, kick a soccer ball? He does that with the baby. The baby falls into the congregation. No crying. Is it dead? 100% healed. No crying. That, that is absolutely shocking. And I might would, let me point this out. In, in, in case you think, oh, that's the, that's the fringe of the charismatic movement. No, that's not the fringe. Smith Wigglesworth, that's one of the charismatic generals. They, they laud him. This is not the fringe. This is the mainstream charismatic 
mainstream. And I promise you, because charismatic, one of the charismatic mantras is this, what God does for one, he'll do for you. And so all these people out there watching this all around the world on Christian television, and they're at home and they're thinking, my kid's sick. My neighbor's kid is sick. What God did for one, he'll do for all. And they think, oh, well, maybe God wants me to throw that baby up against the wall. I'm not exaggerating here. This is real stuff. Shocking. Shocking. Physical dangers, spiritual dangers. By the way, how many false religions have begun by an individual saying, God spoke to me. Let me tell you what he has to say. Practically every false religion, every cult there is began in that exact same way. I mean, you name it. And I'll, I'll name two of them real quickly. Mormonism, Islam. And if you read the biographies, you read the stories behind Joseph Smith and Muhammad, they're eerily similar, eerily similar. Both of these men claim that this entity, this thing, uh, appeared to them. And initially, they thought it was malevolent, bad, scared them. But then over time, they became convinced, no, this really is of God. And now we have two huge false religions that were begun in almost exactly the same ways. Eerie how similar their stories are. And there's no way to prove or disprove this. It's just kind of working theory that I have. I just wonder if it wasn't the very same demon that appeared to both of them. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Interesting. Watch this from Robert Morris. All right. So John chapter 10, look at verse 1. We're talking about we're sheep and we can hear God. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens. Now watch this carefully. And the sheep, watch, hear his voice. Can, can you just say those three words? Hear his voice. It does not say sense his impressions. And I'm not saying that God doesn't give us impressions. I just simply am literally blown away. And, and when I say that, again, I'm not saying it condescendingly because I used to be of the theological persuasion that believed that God didn't speak anymore. And I'm shocked that I could have ever believed that. That he's just, just has chosen not to speak anymore since he wrote us a letter. And we have his word, but now he doesn't communicate personally to his children. I'm just shocked that I could have ever thought that way. Too bad. My sheep hear my voice, John chapter 10. This may be the gold standard of this teaching that God speaks to us today in a direct quotable sense outside of Scripture. My sheep hear my voice. So let's look at this, John chapter 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them and they follow me. Well, doesn't it say right there that God's sheep, we're his sheep, right? They hear his voice. Dear friends, how many times have we heard people quote this verse? I mean, practice, every book out there, every book out there on how to hear the voice of God without exception, all of them, all of them use John 10, 27 to support this notion that God speaks to us today outside of Scripture. But let's look at this in context, shall we? Let's begin in verse 26. Jesus says, but you do not believe me because you are what? You're not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. This verse has absolutely nothing to do with God whispering voices inside your head telling you where to go to have lunch someday. And as Charles Stanley has said, God spoke to him in a still small voice. My sheep know my voice and told him where to go buy his Thanksgiving Day turkey. No, 
That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about salvation. This is salvation. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them. What is this, what is this talking about? This is talking about conversion. Before our conversion, we are sheep. When a person gets saved, that's not a sheep turning into a goat. That's not a goat turning into sheep. Sheep don't turn into goats. Goats don't turn into sheep. Before your conversion, you're a sheep because you've been a sheep from eternity past, from before the foundation of the world. Now, you were a lost sheep. I was a lost sheep. We're still a sheep. So we're out there in life's pasture, grazing around, kind of mounting our own business, you know. And all of a sudden, one, one day, we hear the voice. We hear the voice of the shepherd, and we perk our heads up, and we see the shepherd, and we go to him. That's the effectual call. This is conversion. This is, this is a beautiful, beautiful, majestic passage of Scripture. This is What a horrible trivialization of such a majestic passage of Scripture to reduce this down to something like God telling you where to go to have lunch or what car to buy. No, that's not what this is talking about. This is the new birth. I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. If you've ever wondered about once saved, always saved, eternal security, I would refer to you to John chapter 10 in these verses. They will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. When Jesus calls us, when the good shepherd calls us and we go to him and he puts us in his hand and Jesus says, no one, no one will snatch them out of my hand. And as if his hand were not strong enough, and it is, but as if it were not enough, then he takes the Father's hand. Notice what he says in verse 29. My Father who has given them to me, we are gifts to the shepherd. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. So we are in Jesus' hand and he wraps, metaphorically speaking, wraps the Father's hand around that of his own. And friends, ain't nobody getting through that. What a terrible trivialization of such a beautiful passage of scripture there are many warnings in the bible not to add to the word of god you shall not add to the word which i command you nor take anything from it and and thou not uh, add not unto his words lest he rebuke thee and thou be found a liar revelation 22 well-known verse jesus says for i testify unto every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part of the book of life. We are not to add to or take anything away from the word of God. Oh, yeah, but that, that prohibition in Revelation 22, that's just, talking about, uh, that's just talking about the book of Revelation. It's not talking about the other books, no. No, we believe in what's called the verbal plenary inspiration of Scripture. All of God's Word is equally inspired from, Revel from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21. So if you add to one part, you've added to it all. We're not to add to or take away. So how does God speak to us today? Let's go to the text, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. The writer of Hebrews is saying that in the old days, in the Old Testament days, God spoke to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways. Indeed, he did. God spoke to Moses up on the mountain through a storm and thunder, spoke to Moses through a burning bush, uh, God spoke to Elijah through the still small voice. Again, that was not some inner impression. That was external to Elijah, not internal. Um, Numbers chapter 22, God even made a donkey talk. So God did indeed speak in many different portions and in many different ways. But in these last days, something has changed. Has God changed? No. But his revelation has progressed, culminating in the person of Jesus Christ. In these last days, he has spoken to us in his son. Friends, Jesus is the final speaking of God. The final speaking of God. Everything that God has to say to us, he has said in his son, Jesus Christ. And we have a perfect, inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient record of that in his word. 
Jesus is the final speaking of God. Now, I don't want anybody to be confused and leave here and think, oh, well, Justin said that God doesn't speak to us anymore today. That's not at all what I'm saying. God does speak to us today right here. This is how God speaks to us. Well, if God doesn't speak to us today outside of the Bible, how, how do I know God's will for my life? You know, how do I know where to go to college? How do I know um, what job to take, what house to buy? How do I know who to marry? Well, I can tell you how you know who you marry. The Bible tells us that. You marry a believer. Aside from that, you marry whoever you want to marry. <laughs> but how do I know God's will for my life? You want to know how to know God's will for your life? Read, study, and obey his word. Read, study, and obey his word. Well, yeah, but I've got this decision to make. I've got this thing, these, this choice facing me, and I just, God doesn't tell me which job to take. God, God doesn't, God's word doesn't tell me where to go to college. No, it doesn't. So how do you know God's will for your life? Well, let me try to help a little bit here. Hearing God's voice and discerning his will. Dear friends, God never spoke through hunches, promptings, feelings, or liver quivers. God, that is not how God spoke. He's not, he didn't speak that way in the days of the Bible. He's not speaking that way today. When God did speak, the message was crystal clear. And notice this, New Testament believers never sought God's individual will for themselves. Didn't. It's not there. So how do you know God's will for your life? Read, study, and obey his word. And friends, if you're not doing that, then nothing else matters anyway. Read, study, and obey his word. Pray for wisdom. If you've got some decision facing you and you're not sure what the right thing to do is, pray for wisdom. Pray for wisdom. And God will grant it in abundance. Now, if you're not reading and studying God's word, then don't bother praying for wisdom. He's not going to give it to you. But if you are reading and studying and obeying God's word, pray for wisdom. And then seek wise, godly counsel. Book of Proverbs says there is wisdom, there is safety in a multitude of counsel. Men, go to some godly men you know. Go to some men that you know are walking with the Lord and seek their counsel. I have men in my life that I do that. Now, the first person I'm going to talk to is my wife. And if there's still a need, we both agree, you know, I'm going to go to some godly men I know, some men on my board of directors, my pastor, and I'm going to say, hey, guys, you know, this is what's going on. This is what I'm faced with. Um, what do you think I should do? There's wisdom in doing that. Seek wise, godly counsel. And then look at your abilities and desires. You know, what do you want to do? What are, what are you able to do? What are you good at doing? I had no trouble deciding that God did not want me to be a music leader. I don't, I don't have the ability nor the desire, but look at what you're, you're able to do. If you want to preach, are you able to preach? Are you qualified to preach? If you want to preach and you have the ability and you're qualified, preach. What are your desires? Look at interesting, some interesting verses from the New Testament. Paul says this, I have decided to spend the winter at Nicopolis. Paul didn't say, I sought the Lord for his will in this. I put out a fleece. No, I decided to spend the winter at Nicopolis. Paul stayed in Athens by himself and he sent Timothy because he, he put out a fleece, he cast lots, he thought it was best to do so, and so he did it. And so he did it. Experiences are extremely subjective and therefore unreliable. A lot of people think, well, I've experienced this, so it must be real. No. Lots of people have experiences. Hindus have very real experiences, but they're not from God. Don't base your theology on what you experience. Biblical experiences were real, but not necessarily to be considered normative. This is a fundamental problem that a lot of people make in their hermeneutics. They think because something happened in the Bible that it should be normative for us today. Well, you know what? I believe God parted the Red Sea. I believe that literally happened. Hadn't happened since. You know, I grew up on the banks of the Mississippi River. 
And uh, I believe God parted the Red Sea for Moses. But if I were to walk down to the banks of the Mississippi River, hold my crutches up in the air, I'm not expecting the Mississippi River to part. It happened once. It's not normative. God made a donkey talk. He's not making donkeys talk today. I hope you have not been seeing any talking donkeys. <laughs> Jesus never commanded his disciples to seek experiences or to divine God's will by them, not once. Man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Direct divine guidance in Scripture is not nearly as common as we often think. Even major prophets would go years without hearing from God. New Testament leaders never sought a word from the Lord other than from Scripture. But what we do see is that God, at times, providentially redirected them. He just did it. He just did it. So how do you know God's will for your life? Read, study, obey God's word. Pray for wisdom, seek godly counsel, and then do something. Do whatever you want to do. You don't have to worry, oh, well, if I choose this, but I really should have chosen that, then everything's just going to fall apart and unravel and, you know, like a row of dominoes. Everything's just going to fall apart. No, relax. Relax. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge him, and he might direct your paths. He'll direct your paths if he's got nothing better to do. He will direct your paths. Dear friends, he spoke the universe into existence. I think he can direct our paths. You don't have to worry, oh, well, if I choose this, but I, God really wanted me to choose this, everything's just going to fall apart. No, relax. Relax. Make a wise decision, do whatever you want to do. He spoke the universe into existence. He is holding it together by the word of his power. He can direct your paths. He's got it. He's got it. This from Charles Spurgeon, and I'll, I'll wrap up. Charles Spurgeon says this, I have little confidence in those persons who speak of having direct revelations from the Lord as though he appeared otherwise than by and through the gospel. His word is so full, so perfect, that for God to make any fresh revelation to you or to me is quite needless. To do so would be to put a dishonor upon the perfection of that word. Indeed. Indeed. Dear friends, if you want to hear God speak to you, there is one way. I guarantee you, you will hear God speak. Read your Bible. If you want to hear God speak to you audibly, read it out loud. <laughs> 100% guarantee you will hear him speak. God's word is sufficient. It is sufficient. It is everything that we need pertaining to life and godliness. It is everything that we need to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is everything that we need to live a life of obedience to the glory of God. Don't be bothered by all this other stuff. God speaks to us right here. That's how he speaks. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, how grateful we are for your word. How grateful we are that you have given it to us, that you have preserved it for us, that it is everything that we need, that, that we can be thoroughly equipped unto every good work for the glory of Christ. Father, may we not be uh, distracted by all of these um, unbiblical notions of somehow trying to divine your voice and uh, extract it out and, and uh, tune into the right frequency, Lord. That is, all of that is such, such a distraction, so unbiblical and so belittling to how clearly you have spoken to us in your word. May we rest in that. May we rest in your sovereignty, all for the glory of Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.